Well, I guess I wasn't exactly honest with you the last time. Uh, we're not quite done with economic systems yet. I wanted to spend a little bit of time focusing on the idea of state capitalism uh, because state capitalism used to be thought of as a transition between command economies and capitalist economies with the presumption that everybody would eventually be capitalist after some period of time, but that's really not how it works anymore. When we're talking about a state capitalist economic system, we're talking about an economic system where profit-seeking enterprises are owned or managed by the state. This is a um, this is now looked at as a sustainable model, whereas before it was thought of again just as a as a transition period, as a as a temporary kind of stopping off point before you became fully capitalist. Um, we see that today the um, kind of the state capitalist model tends to be most uh, pronounced in certain parts of the world that had been um, command economies and also in countries that are very heavily reliant upon oil. For example, uh, 10 of the largest oil and gas firms in the world are state-owned. 80% of China's stock market and 62% um, and of Russia's, at least the companies listed on those stock exchange exchanges, are owned by the government. And Brazil and South Africa are starting to dabble in this idea of state capitalism. So I think it's something important for us to understand a little bit about um, before we, we totally back away from economic systems. So let's investigate a little bit more here what state capitalism is. When we look at state capitalism and the uh, and kind of the characteristics of state capitalism, one of the things we have to pay attention to is, is a notion of crowding out. What crowding out refers to is what happens to the private sector when government enters into the, into the economy. Um, you can think about this in terms of what happens when governments start to borrow a lot of money. As the demand for, for borrowing money increases, it tends to drive up the interest rate, which might crowd out private investment because now private investors have to pay higher interest rates. When the government is stepping into an economy and owning companies, this crowding out has some, some different effects. For example, when government steps into the, the market, what ends up happening is that they favor some companies at the expense of others. So the state firms are soaking up capital and they're, and they're buying up labor talent that could be used by private firms and perhaps could be used better by private firms. Another aspect of this crowding out is that research is quite um, consistent in finding that state firms grow more slowly and are more inefficient than private firms. In fact, the, it's kind of like monopoly. When the state firm steps in and they start to, to take over, then they behave more like monopolists. They behave in those kind of, uh, in those ways, those, those, those inefficient ways that we talked about when we talked about monopoly. The question has to be asked when government-owned uh, companies are stepping into markets whether or not those state-run firms can be creative. Or are they just going to end up stealing the ideas of others? This is one of the, the points of stagnant economic growth that is often raised when governments are heavily involved in an economy. State capitalism also tends to favor those people who are well connected and, and basically insiders into the political system and friends of the, the political leaders, much more so than the innovative outsiders, the people who come in and kind of shake up the system or shake up the economy or, um, or, or creative, create creative destruction. You're, you're probably not going to see that creative destruction in, a, in an economy that's state uh, run that, that has the state capitalist uh, mentality. At least that's that's the expectation. And then finally, state 
ownership of firms tends to reduce the fairness of free trade because what ends up happening is they subsidize firms to keep them competitive and that just makes everybody angry, at least people in other countries. This is one of the arguments that has been frequently made about Chinese companies that we, uh, American companies can't compete on, a, on an equal footing, on an equal playing field because they're so heavily subsidized by the government. Now, a lot of this just simply presupposes that government is competent enough to run companies. Unfortunately, we see plenty of examples where this just may not be the case. Uh, in particular, we see this in Venezuela, where the state-run oil company is, is basically in shambles because government incompetence has driven it into the ground. We see a similar uh, story with India's national coal company. The, the company just isn't producing as much as it could, and it's certainly not as efficient as it could be because of state bureaucracy. You could even think of a Marxist, Marxist critique of this in that a single state-owned company can, as, can exploit the workers just as much as a capitalist system could. So there are certainly um, questions about the veracity of state-run capitalism. Nevertheless, it seems to be spreading. So let's see if we can understand a little bit about why. So to start off, let's take a look at some of the history of state-run or state-owned capitalism. We can go back as far as the British East India Company uh, to talk about state-owned companies. This is basically a, a, an outreach um, of, the, of the British crown trying to expand its reach across the globe. So we have the British East India Company. We also have Alexander Hamilton. Um, Alexander Hamilton, the guy on the $10 bill, the guy who the musical was written about, um, he had a very clear position that certain parts of the U.S. economy should be protected uh, by the government. And uh, we kind of refer to this now as infant industry protection, but Hamilton was pretty vigorous, a pretty vigorous supporter of protecting industries, protecting them from competition. In post-World War II, we see France and Japan being active protectors of their, um, of their fledgling or, or kind of rebuilding enterprises. We see this with South Korea as well after World War II, or I'm sorry, after the Korean War. And um, it is, it's not unusual to see countries trying to protect their industries. This is, uh, it may not be a, a, um, an extensive or expansive effort across the entire economy, but there are certainly examples, even in countries that we think of today as being extraordinarily capitalist. In OECD countries, these are a, this is a group of, of economically developed countries, state-owned firms employ over 2 million people. So even in countries that are not thought of as third world countries, not thought of as developing countries, or even former communist countries, we see that state-owned enterprises are certainly uh, active in the economy. More recently, we've seen that countries like Singapore, when it was founded, um, was founded based on this idea of Asian values. Um, the, the, the kind of the George Washington of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yin, uh, said he wanted to mix family values with authoritarianism. And most people said it sounds good to us. So we have this, this idea in Singapore, and Singapore's thought of as a very, very free market country. In China, when Deng Xiaoping started to relax the restrictions on economic activity, basically what was happening was that they were forcing state enterprises to behave more like Western firms. So there was this, this kind of mixing of the way that, uh, that economic behavior was supposed to take place. And this is kind of the story of the transition between the command and the capitalist economy. This is what people thought was going to happen in China, but um, that's not really what happened. The, 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 the advancement, the evolution there sort of slowed down and got kind of stuck in the middle. We also see the Soviet Union with the, the collapse of the Soviet Union in the late 80s and this chaos that that um, 
that 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 was created it led to a sort of a demand for for order and the end of the the active work of the party although it meant chaos it also freed these these political actors up to go out and get involved in businesses and 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 kind of led to this mix of former communist party members involved in business and and there was this uh, additional desire to have more order so so we start to see this this kind of uh, this boulder going downhill where we have these political insiders running businesses and now they're getting back involved with with the uh, with the political system so how does state capitalism work well, really what it does is it melds the power of the state with capitalism. Now, how successful that's going to be depends on government's ability to pick the winners and the losers in the economy. Sometimes they're not very good at this. It's just like picking stocks. Sometimes you pick good ones and sometimes you pick bad ones. As governments try to pick the winners and losers to promote economic growth, sometimes they don't do a very good job of it. The, uh, the idea of state capitalism is to take the tools of capitalism and um, tools like embracing globalization and the stock market um, and use those tools to expand existing businesses under the authority and under the very watchful eye of the state. So let's take a look at a couple of examples of this to see how, uh, to, just to see the variety and how state capitalism can work. We'll start off with China. China is probably the most, probably the most interesting story of all of these um, state-owned capitalist systems. This is a picture of Shanghai, um, a recent picture of Shanghai, and it looks just like this incredibly modern and, and advanced city. And and it is, but it also rose out of the river here with a lot of help from the state. Really what we see in China is that China is handing over the control of firms to adept managers rather than the cronies who would have been in a position to take things over. So this is one of the hallmarks of the Chinese version of state-run capitalism. So instead of giving it to your brother-in-law, letting your or letting your uh, your friends from the from the Communist Party run these companies, the Chinese government says, "Hey, look, this is our company, but we're going to let you run it in such a way as to make money." One of the questions for the future, however, is how do you ensure fair trade? This is the, the biggest critique of the Chinese system. The, because the state subsidizes businesses so heavily, it reduces the costs and then creates this unfair, unfair playing field. Additionally, there's a question of whether firms are being weaponized. And this is the Huawei uh, question or the elephant in the room when it comes to Huawei. Are does Huawei, as, a, as an instrument or as an appendage of the communist government, um, are they using their resources to, to steal intellectual property or uh, collect secrets of other countries? And you don't have that same question raised when you have a privately run company that, has, that is not entangled with the government. But because it's Huawei, that question certainly arises. When it comes to the, uh, the sort of the variations of the, of the uh, Chinese system, we also think about the Communist Party as it is involved and as it is uh, woven into the firm. They may not run the firm on a daily basis, but they are certainly lurking in the background, both physically and psychically. The party tends to be the largest shareholder in these state-owned enterprises in China. So they control who advances and they control where those people work. 
So there is a degree of cronyism, at least to an extent, as far as who moves up and down the ladder. There are notable CEOs that are moved from one company to another, kind of at the whim of the party. And they also tend to control how much you get paid. So there is a party influence when it comes to state capitalism, at least the Chinese version. It's just, um, it's not as, as endemic as it is in some other state capitalist systems. All right, the next illustration or the next example I want to take a look at here is Russia. Russia is, um, is different. We can think of the Kremlin as the capitalist in chief here. Contrary to what we see in China, the state owns huge stakes in companies through shared ownership. But the people who were running these companies, the private sector uh, oligarchs, end up getting replaced with those who are tied to the state, with who are political hacks, who are political friends. Uh, particularly in Russia, people who are friends of Putin. The economy then ends up being dominated by just a few really large firms who are controlled by political figures. And of course, that means they're going to behave like monopolies. There's also another problem with the, with the Russian system, is, and that is that uh, there is, or has been at least, incredibly poor infrastructure. So, there's a lot of vertical integration that results. So steel companies buy parts, uh, buy parts companies to ensure that they can get the products that they need, that, so they can get the inputs that they need, so they can ship their products as scheduled. So, sort of the the supply chains are quite different in Russia as a result of of the poor infrastructure. Uh, you just you you buy the companies that you need to supply you the inputs. Otherwise, you may not get them. Another illustration of a state capitalist system are what we call the petrostates. These are states that re rely primarily upon oil as their main economic engine. Now, this is a picture of the Middle East and North Africa, but this also applies to places like Venezuela. So, the sort of the biggest problem with these states tends to be the, the just the political failure. There's lots of corruption. How do you keep any royals? So if you're in a country where there are um, that is run by a royal family, how do you keep the royals from messing things up? And you are uh, sort of at the mercy, at the whim of asset bubbles. And we've seen this very recently in the case of Russia and Saudi Arabia in terms of of rising oil prices and then you let the air out of the bubble and and then what do you have so we see this in, in Saudi Arabia we see this in Russia we see this in Venezuela we see this in anywhere where you're in just almost exclusively dependent upon that asset one of the success stories here has been Dubai and the reason that's been a success is because there's been such a concentrated effort on diversifying so even though uh, it's governmentally directed diversification and there is cronyism and there is corruption um, Dubai has been able to, to avoid relying so heavily upon the oil uh, commodity and, and has been able to dodge some of the, the problems that exist with asset bubbles. And that brings us to our last illustration or our last um, example here, and that is Brazil. Brazil... Brazil is the enigma here. Uh, the question is, will it become state capitalist? Will the country kind of move from, from a, a, a what is thought to be a developing capitalist democracy, or will it become a state capitalist system? There have been some examples of the government stepping in to control and take over certain industries. Uh, the Veil Mining Company has been essentially taken over, where the government has become, a, uh, in, in most cases, the government becomes a minority shareholder. But in the case of Veil, in the case of uh, Petrobras, which we'll talk about here in a second, they, have, they are the majority owners. Now, 
most of the time, this is a, this is a replacing direct government control with indirect control. That's the government being a minority stakeholder in companies. And when governments do that, when they uh, get intricately involved with a few state champions, um, as long as they don't take them over, there are a few advantages of minority shareholders. One of those advantages is that it, it limits the ability of the state to use state-owned enterprises to pursue social policies or simply to reward clients. So because they don't own enough shares of the company, because they're not uh, in, in a majority position, they can't use this as a social policy tool. Additionally, state holdings can provide funding for investment even though uh, the capital market in Brazil is underperforming or underdeveloped. So the state can, can basically inject funds into a company and help them to, uh, to be able to invest in areas that need to be invested in. But in the case of Brazil, this has sort of been a mess. And the most lurid example of this is the state-run oil company Petrobras, which is, seems to have its tentacles all over South, South America and has gotten a lot of people in big trouble, including some heads of state who have had to resign and, uh, and flee to avoid jail time. So it, it seems like Brazil is just, um, just doesn't have its act together enough to make the state capitalism work. So we've seen four examples of state capitalism, and the one thing that they all really have in common is the kind of the natural proclivity to to, to fall into a, a fall into corruption or be uh, sus, uh, subject to corruption. Politicians in these cases have an enormous amount of power, and they can re-regulate and redesign companies with the stroke of a pen. Uh, authoritarian governments are are prone to do this anyway, so this just kind of gives them an opportunity to expand their power base into the economy. Even democratically elected politicians, like those in Brazil, can end up telling firms what to do, which may not always be in the firm's best interest. Um, political hacks can end up running businesses, and in some cases, as in the case of Russia, as in the case of Venezuela, you just run the business into the ground and the business collapses. And that's really not good for anyone. So the question is, can, can states avoid those particular problems? Successful state-owned enterprises can turn the tables, not, not just turn the tables on um, success or failure, but they can turn the tables on the political uh, powers that are trying to control them. In China, for example, the pressure to pay higher dividends to the owners of the company, which simply means to take some of the profits and move it to the, to the government because the government is a majority shareholder, those have actually been thwarted pretty consistently, which is a, uh, a remarkable thing considering the pressure that's put on the CEOs of companies. Managers seem to be getting better in China and more sophisticated. They're learning more about how to do business at the international level. And, um, and those worldly wise managers are moving uh, into politics and taking some of what they've learned in the business world into the political world. With that being said, there are three caveats that we have to uh, consider while, as we assess the, uh, the success of state-run capitalism. One of those caveats is that there's no clear dividing line between the state-owned and private firms. So basically what we're saying is that there's no good way to compare the outcomes of the two. After all, Huawei is technically private, but there's so much government involvement in the running of that company that we can't really say, um, we can't really make a comparison between the state-owned and the privately-owned firms uh, in China. A second thing is that ownership isn't the only thing at play here. Some of the problems that exist are due to rapid development, not necessarily who owns what. So it might be that Chinese companies look like they're growing tremendously well under the state-run capitalism, except for the fact that it's just natural economic growth. So it really wouldn't matter who owns the companies.
And then finally, context is incredibly important. State ownership can do some things well. They can do infrastructure okay. And they do some things really, really poorly, like consumer goods. It boosts development at some stages. That, that state-owned capitalism boosts development at some stages, and then it really impedes it at other stages. So we have to understand where we are in the contextual scheme of things before we give a, a final stamp of approval or, a, or a, a blanket denial of state capitalism. There are clearly some severe flaws as well. Can state capitalism properly regulate the market if it owns the firms? Can it proper, properly keep an eye on the bad behaviors of their firms if they are owning the firms? That's a significant question. Will it throw good money after bad? In other words, will it take money that could be used to help develop the economy in one area and just simply throw it after uh, failing state-owned enterprises? This seems to be the way that um, state-owned capitalism has been working in some parts of the world, and certainly how command systems have worked for generations. Can it be innovative? Can these companies innovate if it means that it's got to give, that they have to release the reins and give freedom, give more freedom to experiment and freedom to fail? Those are significant questions that state-owned capitalism haven't been able to, uh, to really deal with in, uh, in their evolution. So the future of state capitalism may be determined by two specific things. One of them is rent seeking. Rent seeking by corporate elites and managers who are running the companies uh, is, uh, is what occurs when they're just simply trying to um, maintain their position, maintain their monopoly position or maintain their jobs. What are they doing um, to accomplish those objectives. In other words, are managers seeking their own self-interests at the expense of the company? Are, um, are the politicians seeking their own self-interests at the, at the expense of the company? Those are questions that still need to be addressed. Um, and it's hard to address those things because of the um, incestuous nature of the party, the government, and business. Are po politicians too distracted by other things to provide good oversight? So are they unable to pay attention to what's going on behind the curtain while this rent seeking is taking place? Or are they just not even aware that it's going on? Are the boards that are running the companies weak and disorganized, which would lay, lay the groundwork for more rent seeking? And what is the company's mission? The company's mission is a, can easily become a confusion of commercial success and social success. So in other words, um, it's confusion of whether it's commercial success that's important or the success of the state. The principal agent problem is an enormous one in state-owned enterprises because those state-owned enterprises, especially in places like China and Russia, become sources of jobs and sources of patronage to pay off political supporters. And if you're not careful, everything just kind of devolves back into the old command system that existed before without the innovation that, has, that is potentially there in state-owned capitalism. So that's one determinant of the future of state capitalism is, is rent-seeking. How much rent-seeking is going on and, and how pervasive does it become? The other is the soundness of the states themselves. In China, for example. There's still uh, corruption and reliance on connections, no matter what the government says they're trying to do to ferret these things out. Um, it just tends to be that, that those things persist. In Russia, you notice there's that corruption again and nepotism. In Brazil, there's corruption again and insider entrenchment. State capitalism expands opportunities for corruption so much by increasing the size and the range of the prizes because if the state owns a company and becomes the monopoly, then the, the wealth that can be generated for the people who are on the, on the inside can potentially be enormous. So just to wrap this up, um, state-owned capitalism can be a, can be a big problem. Um, 
it can also lead to problems um, for com companies that are trying to move into those countries from overseas. Uh, and those companies have to start to kowtow to the political forces. This is the, this is the huge argument with Apple and, and Google in China. What are you going to do to um, assuage the political forces in those, in those countries that you're trying to move into? And are you violating the, the tenets of what you believe? Um, we can also see that the West starts to emulate some of these state-owned enterprises. We see this in uh, just kind of just at the early levels in, in places like France and in Italy. Um, France has the sovereign wealth fund that is owned and operated by the government. And then we have to ask the question about whether or not this erodes liberty, liberty of people to pursue what they want to pursue, to pursue opportunities, to, to grow economies, to invest in the future. Because with the state-owned enterprises, it is incredibly difficult not only to compete, but just to get your just to get started, because the state may not want that competition. And then if you start to turn those companies into state organs, it ends up corrupting the system and severely inhibiting the competitive behaviors that would, would lead to economic growth. So that's really it as far as um, as far as economic systems are concerned. The state capitalism is, a, is an interesting beast. It's an interesting uh, mix, and it seems like it's, for now at least, here to stay.